Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should probably check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. So get enrolled into this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. If you're looking to upgrade your sleep, do it today with a bare mattress. You're guaranteed to get the proper back support, pressure relief, and comfort or your money back. Every bare mattress is proudly made in the USA and comes with two free pillows. Try the top rated bare mattress risk free for 100 nights. You can learn more at baremattress.com slash bourbon. That's B E A R mattress.com slash bourbon. Catoctin Creek is a proud supporter of Bourbon Pursuit. At Catoctin Creek, they pride themselves on making traditional rye whiskey as it would have been made in the 1800s. Virginia grain, Virginia water, Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. You there? Huh? Yeah, he's sounding fine to my end. We can hear Blake. He's good here. Kenny? Oh, that means Kenny's having trouble. Oh, Oh, it's me having problems? Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Man, you just automatically assumed it was me with the internet. Kenny. Have you checked Wi Fi speed recently? <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 299 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start the 55th Bourbon Community Roundtable, here's your weekly bourbon news update. The Kentucky Distillers Association has announced that the Bro Brothers Distillery in Louisville, the first and only African-American-owned, licensed, and operating distillery in the state of Kentucky, is the newest and 42nd member of the KDA. It was founded by Victor, Bryson, and Christian Yarborough, three brothers who were born and raised in Louisville. Bro Brothers Distillery is the KDA's 24th craft level member, aging less than 10,000 barrels per year. Could you be the next George Costanza? Well, maybe not balding with glasses, but you could be a hand model for Fistful of Bourbon and win $100,000. The company is calling the casting call the search for the $100,000 fist, with the lucky winner appearing in future print, video, and social media campaigns. Applicants must be at least 25 years old, authorized to work in the U.S., and you can enter on Fistful of Bourbon's website. Wild Turkey and Russell's Reserve have announced a donation of $20,000 to the Kentucky Distillers Association's Lifting Spirits Foundation. It's a program aimed at increasing the diversity in distilled spirits through scholarships. The donation will cover credits for students attending bourbon-related certification courses at the University of Louisville, the University of Kentucky, and Kentucky State University, with preference given to black students, women, people of color, LGBTQ, and other underrepresented groups. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Jefferson's is releasing its second rye in the brand's near 25-year history, and it's called Jefferson's Rye Cognac Finish. The double-barreled straight rye whiskey was fully matured prior to being finished in hand-selected cognac casks for at least nine months in Kentucky. This expression will be released at an easy sipping 94 proof with a suggested retail price of $70. It will be available nationwide, both in-store and online at Drizzly and Reserve Bar. Barrel Bourbon has a new line of products out under a brand new label called Stellum. They are introducing a bourbon which focuses on five to six year old Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee profiles using three different Indiana mash bills. It also includes barrels from four to 16 years old. The rye is rooted in the 95.5 Indiana mash bill, but accented with rye barrels from Kentucky and Tennessee, ranging from four to 10 years old. And there will also be single barrels, but all of these will be bottled at cask strength. The bourbon will be at around 115 proof, the rye at 116, and these will be blended to consistency with a retail price of $55. Available in 45 markets nationwide, and you can also buy online at stellum.com. Maker's Mark is releasing their annual Keeneland bottles, but this year, it's a little bit different. This year, it's benefiting the Lex Arts organization and their work on the behalf of Isaac Murphy Memorial Art Garden in Lexington. 
This is the first park in the U.S. to honor black jockeys. For the first time, this release is not one, but three different bottles, each with its own label, featuring the work of artist Sandra Oppegaard, Andre Pieter, and Tyler Robertson. The bottles are all pre-signed by the artists who created each label, along with Keeneland President and CEO Shannon Arvin, Maker's Mark Managing Director Rob Samuels, and one of three active Hall of Fame jockeys who have won the Grade 1 Maker's Mark Mile at Keeneland multiple times. So you've got Javier Castellano, Edgar Prado, and John Velasquez. All bottles will go on sale this Friday, April 2nd of 2021. Four Roses Small Batch Select is going to start expanding to greater markets this spring. This is the 104 proof, non-chill filtered version that was introduced back in 2019. And the new states are as follows. Alabama, Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, Louisiana, Maryland, Minnesota, Nevada, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Virginia, and Washington, DC. This expansion brings the total to 30 states where Small Batch Select will now be available. All right. By now, you would have thought I have gone through all the news. Well, the roundtable, we're back at it with another gathering to talk about some more news and our takes on it. We discuss Heaven Hill versus Log Still Distilling over the use of the Dant name and trademark. And what does direct-to-consumer shipping in Kentucky mean now that distillers can cut out the wholesalers? And if you were to spend $1,400 stimulus check on bourbon, what would you spend it on? Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it all at cash strength. And you can now even buy them online. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. Now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Don Knott, a longtime listener to Bourbon Pursuit, who writes me on FredMinnick.com. He writes... People are posting bottles of bourbon on social media all the time. Has this jumped the shark? Oh boy. Oh boy. Don's uh, Don's uh, trying to ruffle some feathers here, trying to, you know, get into the Instagrams and the TikToks of the world and uh, and say, like, all right, you're posting too much. Uh, I mean, there was a long time where We were just kind of like hoping that people would cut back on their crotch shots. And now that's finally happened. And so now people are doing like curated photos with with their bourbon bottles. And, you know, I don't think it's jumped the shark. I think what has happened is the game has gotten a lot harder. I mean, time was you could just have a glass and a bourbon bottle next to a fire. Uh, or on a golf course, and you know, you'd get so many likes, and people would be like, "Ooh, that's very nice." But I mean, now, I mean, you gotta, you gotta have some content behind it. You can't just post a bottle. And there's a never-ending amount of bourbon people, like Don, I'm suspecting, that will call you out if you're just kind of like going into a store and picking up a bottle. It's like, oh, 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 oh look what I got, you know. But I, I just think that's just a part of the modern world. I mean. You know, take a look at tennis shoes. You know, old school Jordans are like, you know, posted on Instagram all the time. I look at those and salivate and remember a time long ago. And I just think it's, you know, I just think bourbon's a part of that entire like lifestyle that Instagram and TikTok presents. Uh, But we are in that luxury space. And it's kind of like, you know, for those of us who actually enjoy bourbon and for those of us who look at bourbon as something more. Uh, than just a status symbol, it can be quite a bit frustrating. So I agree with you there, Don. It is frustrating just to see that, but it's not going to go anywhere. So it certainly has not jumped the shark. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you're like Don and you got an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button and let me know your idea. Until next week, cheers. Welcome, everybody, to this week's podcast of Bourbon Pursuit. We are at the 55th Bourbon Community Roundtable and got myself and Fred from the Bourbon Pursuit crew. So, Fred, how you doing on this uh, lovely weekend? We had kind of a little surprise Sunday rather than our usual Monday. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's nice. I'm actually heading out of town tomorrow, so this is uh, perfect for me. It worked out much better for my schedule. And, and most importantly, the world gets to see you uh, publicly with those sweet glasses. <laughs> I tell you what, man, this has been a killer 
week for me. So I'm going in for a LASIK consultation and they said, you can't wear contacts for a week and you have to wear your glasses and you have to put in eye drops four times a day to do like all these scans. And it's been tough because I never wear glasses. And so every day I feel like my body isn't in the right equilibrium. It's, it's, it's like I can't see underneath my eyes. I can't see over top. But in the middle is OK. So I feel like I'm constantly dizzy is what it felt like. Or maybe well, just they, they, they look good on you. But I, of course, I uh, I have astigmatism, so I can't wear the my astigmatism to the point where I can't wear um, contacts. So I've I've worn glasses pretty much my whole life and uh you know i feel weird without him so my, my wife was like you should have just done this like 10 years ago and i was like you're right I, I probably should have just been putting it off forever and just been buying contacts but well soon a laser will be touching your eye and uh you'll be all better <laughs> well, let's fingers crossed <laughs> if not <laughs> lasers and eyes that's i've avoided that <laughs> I was like, if not, we're gonna have one blind co-host here, and it'll be fine. <laughs> you can you can still sniff bourbon and taste it. I was gonna say, well. it, was gonna say it, to it'll accentuate your yeah. your other senses. Yeah, and they'll be like, "What color is this?" And like, ah, I guess some sort of hay copper, like maybe <laughs> just a guess. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and we'll introduce the rest of the crew today. So Jordan from Breaking Bourbon, how are you? Good. Thanks for having us, Kenny. I'm uh, Jordan, one of the three guys from Breaking Bourbon, and. uh you know, check us out on all the socials and all that stuff, our latest release calendar. But as always, we're pumped to be here. And, uh, you know, our streak continues on, at least having Breaking Bourbon on the show. So oh. sorry. Hey. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Not so, holding back. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't tell you yet. But yeah, Blake is not here. He didn't join us. He actually said he forgot about it. So we'll see. Mm. You know, he's he's good for a pop in at some point. So we'll we'll see if he might do that. We've we've got 45 minutes to see if he'll, he'll actually join us here. But. You know what? Wait, if if we find out that he's like on another like uh like podcast tonight or like oh, he's live off. stream, oh, I yeah, mean, oh, it'll break my heart. It would. It mm -hmm. would. It's that's a that's an easy red card. He's out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and the star of the show tonight, Ooh, Brian. I don't know about that. Thanks for having me again, though. Uh, BCR, what fifty five? Is that what we're at? We are. Good yeah. gracious! So Blake makes it fifty four, but. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see him. So Brian from Sipping Corn Bourbon uh, Bourbon Justice, find me at the socials at either of those, and this this will be a fun one. This is right down my alley, and uh, happy to take some flack on behalf of attorneys for why people can't do some things that maybe make sense for what they should be able to do with their own name. So uh, I'm excited for this one. Well, we're gonna we're gonna need all your years of lawyering to make sure you school everybody tonight. <laughs> 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 and you know, I guess I spoke too soon because guess what happened? Here he is. Here he comes. Oh, yeah. They wow. counted him Just out. They the said, he, uh, "Yeah, yeah." It's, <laughs> the streak cannot be broken. I know. Yeah. You know, the there's others out there cheering against me that I wouldn't show up, <laughs> but I'm here. Just got done cooking a whole hog and uh, kind of <laughs> slipped my mind that it was tonight. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell your wife thank you so Sunday. much while she puts away the rest of the hogs. So. Oh, she's like, she's like, you know, putting stuff into Tupperware, picking up kids' toys. I'm like, I'm out. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We got this bourbon podcast I've got to be on once a yeah, month. Yeah, yeah. Like it's very important, Danielle. She's like, shut up. I know those guys. This is not. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. All right. Well, everybody knows Blake, so we, we don't even need the introduction. So easy. Yeah, enough. I'll skip it. I'll skip it. We'll let you we'll let you do it at the very end. We'll let you close it out with it. Perfect. So our first topic tonight. So last week, Heaven Hill filed a new lawsuit against log still distilling. Well, but why? Well, Logstill Distilling had launched in 2019 and is currently building a new distillery in Gethsemane, Kentucky. It's set to actually open this spring. But so how is this still a problem? Well, Logstill is being revived by John Wallace Dant, who is the great, great, great grandson of John Washington Dant and also two other heirs. And on its website, Logstill actually says that it's reviving the Dant legacy one barrel at a time. Now the original JW Dant web or sorry the original JW Dant started making bourbon in 1836 and the business was controlled by his family for more than a century. It eventually sold the brand in 1943 to United Distillers and after decades of more transactions the bourbon brand was purchased in 1993 by Heaven Hill and it's still in continuous usage today. 
Now they are accusing Logstill of actually violating the trademark law by using his own last name, which would suggest they are affiliated with the existing brand. And Heaven Hill says that a family connection does not give them the rights to use a federal trademark since the Dant family gave up the use of that mark for some value back in the day. And Heaven Hill also wrote something which I find kind of humorous and it's a nice little jab saying, and the legacy does not need reviving. It's been alive and well since 1836. So, you know, before we get Brian, I guess Brian's going to just like tell us what the actual law is. I yeah, think I was going to should... say, do we even like jump in with our like amateur opinions here? <laughs> yeah, jump, yeah just absolutely so can... jump in. Jump in. <laughs> I think we should jump with some amateur opinions. So I, I, I see this, you know, we, we've seen what Brian was able to do with uh, Castle and Key and kind of talk about a, a mark as as part of this. Now, he's going to he's going to give us the actual meaning of, of really how this all kind of boils down and what's really going to happen here. We also kind of saw a little bit of a, a little Dant pickup. I know a few of you have some blogs that talk about Logstill and about Dant, and you recently had some comments from Dant family members starting to uh, starting to increase. Now, I don't know if that is in relation to this or it's just in maybe they are excited to actually have a, a, a new Dant in the in the distilling business, but I know that Stephen Beam is connected to the Dant legacy, so there's mm -hmm. a, a few things going on there. Um, however, with Stephen Beam over at Limestone, you know they they talk about the Dant legacy, but they don't have any products or um, anything that would really kind of associate or connotate to it. Um, so they're in the clear. But I'll, I'll that's a really I roundabout maybe, way of turning it to maybe, you all. <laughs> maybe that could be used as precedent in the Dant case, you know, from their side, like. Well, over here, the limestone branch folks talk about mm. the dance side. You know, I mean, who knows? But uh, uh, gosh, I the minute I saw this, my first thought was like, you know, I first of all, I think we 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 all need to bring this up. This really has nothing to do with the quality of the whiskey or anything like that, which is what I typically care about. I've been covering these damn trademark lawsuits for ever, and it just it, it, these companies. Brian is like he's like a god in the legal world now because all he does is, you know, write about, uh, you know, trademark law and bourbon because all they do is friggin sue each other over damn mm -hmm. trademarks all the time. And I and I look at and I'm looking at the, the damp brand that Heaven Hill owns and I'm going back to seeing if I can find any advertisements or any marketing strategies or anything that they have done for that brand other than ha have it be an incredible value and put it in, in, the, in the liquor store. And I can't, I cannot find a single strategy outside of like maybe Bernie Lubbers, like bringing it to a bar to pour for someone. I mean, I really can't. And they're about to spend more money on legal fees than they ever did for, for marketing on this brand. Yeah. The five of us have probably talked more about Dant on the round table than heaven hill has over the last, yeah. <laughs> yeah. last 30 years I, I, no. I mean there you know there's no social media push there's no i don't even know if they really mention it in tours like and now granted i've never done every tour but that's a great point like it is just kind of funny that they're going all in but i, I guess you have to um and and I know Brian will answer this, but how do you stop somebody from using their own name? That's like a whole right. big yeah. point of you know a mark in general is you can't stop somebody from using their own name. But I don't know how that works in relation to the whiskey business. But I don't know. I I, I think it's probably a win for uh, the Dant family. And and this sounds bad, but that they are because I think this brings it to more attention and gives you know this new distillery a little more um attention starting out i'm sure it's a pain and a headache but at the same time hey we're talking about it and we're probably going to dedicate the next 20 minutes talking about it yeah. and there's going to be more articles that come out after this and um overall you know the current jw dant that we have on the shelf is an unbelievable value it's delicious bourbon and so i, I don't know like we'll see what happens with the new distillery yeah, and jordan i know you got a take on this too but before they before I wanted to say one other thing, like before, um, you know, so that's my side of that's my take on the Heaven Hill side and on the dance side. I mean, what were you thinking? Did you not think of maybe picking up the phone call and trying to like license the name? And maybe they did. I, I don't know. But but uh, like to me, like there is there is a this could have been like 
resolve before you know it, it ever came out. But um, and I, I'd love to see Dance in the back in the business. Kid me, it's one of the biggest names in bourbon history. They're so important, mm -hmm. and you know what Wally's doing is great. I'm excited for it. But like, I, I mean, I mean, they had to know. I mean, they had it's, to know. It's one of those things where you know it's normally no no press is bad press, right? Because you got people talking about Dant, people are talking about the distillery. In Heaven Hills cases, though, it, it might be a little bit of bad press, and only because, right? They really haven't marketed the Dant name too much. They really don't do much with it whatsoever. And you know, when you think about bourbon, especially you know everyone watching it, I mean, bourbon's like the people's drink. Like this is accessible. It's still cheap. Like when you think of bourbon, this is yeah, this is the American drink. And now here's a company saying. Well, except you can't use your last name anymore. And that gets people mm -hmm. going, well, wait a second. Like, even if the law, you know, no matter what the law says, it's still people associate their last name with, they can do whatever they want with it. Right. So then they start taking a connotation of all of a sudden it's a big company going after the little man. So it might, it might end up biting heaven Hill that way, but either way, both people are, you know, everyone's talking about both brands. I think more so though, you know, with Fred's impression of a Kentucky lawyer, that's now what I envision Brian sounding like every time he goes into a courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, he, he has this nice southern drawl right. and everything. Exactly. I do declare. Yeah, exactly. I do declare. <laughs> All yeah. right. So you guys hit on one of the one of the issues that I wanted everyone and people on the chat to comment on. Uh, can you use your own name? And and if you can't, why why in the hell can't you use your own name? I mean, it's it's been in. It's a, it's, they've been in the generation, I, you know, they've gotten out of, out of uh, whiskey making for, I guess, two, three generations, but it's a family name. It's a historical name. Why can't you use it? So that's sort of question one to pose to everybody. And then two, there, there used to be two Dant distilleries because uh, JW's son, JB, opened up his own and they both used the Dant name in their, in their whiskey. Although JB ended up, he's the one who made limestone. So that's the Steve Beam. Uh, connection. So they they have both uh, Beam, obviously, connection and, and Dant connection. And they're really careful on how they use both of those names because they're protected uh, registered trademarks. Uh, then the other question for everybody is, Wally is building this on one of those two sites. Um, there used to be one of the Dant distilleries on this site. Um, and so why can he or can't he or should he be able to out that fact that he's he's rebuilding on the original side of whichever distillery this is and talk up all the history that happened on that site um so we've talked a little bit about the about the naming stuff what about the the location i mean can you should you be able to say that you've got this this is the place where the Dant distillery was well i mean i think that you sort of set that precedent a little bit while back when with old Taylor. So if the distillery is called the Dant distillery and it really was the Dant distillery, then that will probably fly. Now that is, that is a location that is not a product, I guess is, is the best way to put it. The, yep. if it was, yeah, if they were going to try to come out with, you know, Dant junior, uh, whatever it's going to be, mm -hmm. that probably isn't going to fly. I mean, it, I take it in the same exact way. Now I have no relation or even no, who started the Coleman empire of, you know, coolers and lanterns, <laughs> but odds are I probably can't get into outdoor equipment and start selling and putting my name on it. Just a guess. That's, that's going to come down with a pretty heavy hammer. Hold yeah. on. You're saying you're not the cool, the guy who put all the coolers out. You're uh... I just always thought that was the case the entire time. I assumed it was you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Royalty. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. I'm not sending you all any kind of cool coolers in the mail. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the the old Taylor case exactly involved that. I mean, it was a it's was still standing. Obviously, here there's nothing standing, and the problem here is Wally was using something else called Dant Crossing. That's a sort of made up name that he decided to use. He's there. There's not a geographic location. There's not a building that's still there that he's touting as, hey, this used to be the place. Um, he's making a new place, and he's using the Dant name. And maybe the worst thing is he's he's set, he's trying to harken back on what he filed as his trademark, 1836. And as Kenny mentioned at the top, that's when J.W. Dant started distilling in a in a log. Um, Wally's got no connection to 1836, and the allegation in the complaint is it's going to confuse consumers if he starts talking about 1836 and he starts talking about the Dant legacy. 
and dance this, dance that, that, because that's the brand that's existed for all these years and that Heaven Hill owned since 1993. And so he really doesn't have much of a leg to stand on as... Is what you're kind of coming here with. I'm not seeing a whole lot of legs to stand on. And there was um, one of the, there's some images in the complaint that they uh, put in the body of it. And one of them is an article that says log still, and then parentheses, formerly JW Dan uh, celebrates his first ribbon cutting. You know, that's not it. That's, that's not accurate. And it's showing that there's confusion between Wally, what's Wally Dan is starting and the historical brand that's existed. And there's other distillers all along the line that have run into trouble trying to use their own name. I mean, if you go on the Maker's Mark tour, you hear this great story about Marge and the wax and the kitchen and all these sorts of things, and they wanted to do something new. It makes a nice story, but it's not exactly a full story because what Bill Sr. founded and what he got sued over was was calling his was using the Samuel's name in his in his distillery name. He had to change the name because he got sued. So there's that lawsuit out there. There's a few others because bourbon is so connected with using names and it's your son's name and it's your uncle's name. Everyone wants to use that name so it's protected and you can't use the same name that if it's going to cause confusion. Even though it's your name, you can't put your own name now, on. Now Brian, you said he didn't have much of a leg to stand on. But what if his legs were made of money and he had a whole lot of money? <laughs> yes. But he then they were golden perhaps. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then ask how much money does Max have? Because the complaint alleges in 2019, Wally came to Max and said, Max, buddy, pal, why don't you sell me the, the Dant name? Uh, let me license it. And Max told him, nope. And so they did it anyway. So that, that goes to show that he did try to make a deal. Heaven Hill wasn't willing to make a deal. And it sort of shows Wally knows he needed to ask. Yeah. That's pretty damning. If you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, uh, you know, and I brought that up in, in the very beginning. So like, you know, going back to the, my, my original thought when I was talking about the dance is like, okay, so you had the conversation and, and it didn't go your way. <laughs> you did it anyway. Right. So you did it anyway. I mean, when you look at something like this, Brian, what could possibly be the, the repercussions or what could potentially be the outcome? Would Wally just say, that's fine, let's just drop it now? Or is Heaven Hill saying like, no, you started this, like we're going to finish it. And is it going to be monetary? Is it going to be like, well, this distillery is, you know, they're going to they're gonna bankrupt them. Like what what's the possible ways that this could go? Yeah, at, at this early stage, fortunately for Wally, you know, with not not having product out, not having bourbon out with that name on it and with that 1836 logo that he has, he's got a chance to to change everything and to try to work out a deal. And that happens a lot. There's a lot of threats from from big distilleries to startup distilleries, and they end up changing one word and they get to maybe keep the same logo. I mean, that's happened uh, here within the last eight years. A, a distillery want, had to change their name or the second word of their name and they got to keep their logo. Um, so a lot of times these big distilleries are going to be threatening lawsuits or suing because they feel they need to enforce their trademark, but it's early enough that you get to change something. Um, when it gets too far off the trails, you got a situation like Brown Foreman and and Barton when they actually had to take those bottles of Ridgewood Reserve off the retail shelves. Now that gets expensive, um, but here we're early enough that they should be able to make a deal. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I think it'll be and, fun to kind of see how this is going to play out. Blake, do you have a, something else to add there? Yeah, I just had a question on that. And the deal, will, I mean, from what you're saying, will most likely be like, you can't use any of this, right? Or you think they could come to a Better compromise for the Dant family. Yeah, at and this point, I mean, my, my guess is it's going to be your, your first guess. You can't use any of this. Now, Brian, say those initial negotiations back in 2019 didn't go great, right? Yeah. Could, could they kind of really drive this through hard in the courts and try and put on a business right here and now? Um, well, I don't know what the damages are going to be right now. So I don't know that they're going to be do enough to get them out of business because they don't, again, they don't have that product out. They haven't sunk a bunch into putting this on bottles. It's not out in the market. They've, they've sued early enough that damages should be low. Um, and I, I think they'll be able to move on. So they will be able to bounce back from it, but assuming log still, still gonna, 
a name that doesn't matter? I mean, does that have any yeah, connotation log, yeah. to history? Log still should be fine. Uh, call it log still all day long. Uh, I think the, the way I read the complaint and the motion for an injunction is that, that Heaven Hill's concerned about the name, uh, use of the name Dan. So the moral of the story is when you are looking for a name for your bourbon, you have a good trademark attorney and you do a lot of searching to make sure that there is nothing that could possibly be connotated. <laughs> I think it's more than that, though. I mean, I think there's pride here. I don't think this has anything to do with like, uh, you know, legality. And, we, and, and Jordan brought brought up uh, this in the beginning. Folks, we might be looking at a PR play. I mean, I remember Dave Pickerel when he was uh, part of starting a Popcorn Sutton's brand. They purposely created a uh, their logo to be almost exactly like Jack Daniels just so they would get you know sued <laughs> and get all that press and they'd be like oh well we didn't know we didn't mean to but by the time that they got uh, you know they changed everything you know they got a half a million dollars worth of press out of it so that yeah. might be the angle as well um but Brian I want to know and I know this you might be you know breaking your profession here a little bit I want to know what both sides are going to spend on legal fees. Can you give us an estimation? Oh, man, I can't even estimate. I mean, lawsuits have a way of getting a life of their own. So if this isn't resolved right away, I mean, it, it, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars for Heaven Hill and for Wally. Um, so any kind of length of, of a fight. So Heaven Hill could uh, spend half a million dollars in legal fees? Uh, depending how, yeah, depending if this is a three year case, uh, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, it depends that they have lawyers on retainer and in house and whether they're, how much they're actually paying. I have also, no one of these people probably, you know, one of the parties actually has half a million dollars to spend on legal fees. One probably doesn't. So, you know, yeah. probably won't right. get that far. I don't know. Wally's, Wally's all right. He's, uh, yeah, he's, yeah. I mean, the he's got, he's got press releases, it. yeah, it's a ton of money Wally's put into this. You know, and the other thing he can do here is, is, he can try to make new precedent here. I mean, he can make an argument that, uh, you know, the Dant name is his. And in this particular situation for facts that we don't know yet, because all we've seen is the complaint. So maybe there's something else out there. But under some set of facts, he should be able to use the Dant name. And it's worth it to him for to fight that either out of principle or for marketing purposes or for, for some other reason. He's got some some argument we don't know about. So this this could this could go on. Uh, you know, Heaven Hill's always very aggressive. They've, uh, you know, like they protect Evan Williams like a, like a hawk. You know, there was a there was a distillery in uh, North Carolina that had like origins to like the 1700s that they they kind of kept from using, you know, some some Williams language. And I, I I get it for brands that for brands that are your flagships, but. There's just I, I I'm going back to what we stated at the top. There's just not been a lot of love to this brand. And it just feels it just it feels as silly to me as when uh Jim Beam stood up for old crow. I'm like, what the fuck have you all ever done for old crow? You know? It it just it, I don't know, Brian. It just feels it feels silly to me to protect a trademark that you put like no effort in. Is that wrong? I mean, I'd say if you're, it's a revenue generating part of your business, you got to protect it no you matter what. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, they, they allege in the complaint that in 2019, they sold 25,000 cases. So it's, it's not the biggest brand. It's not in all 50 states, uh, but it's, it's a source of revenue and they own, they, they own the mark and you got to protect it. Part of the law the for trademark law is if you, if you have a registered mark, and you think it's being infringed upon, you got to protect it. So that's why all these companies, whenever there's a whiff of violation or infringement, they they send a cease and desist letter and sometimes have to sue. Yeah, there is a great comment on here too, that even though it might not be having a lot of marketing behind it today, they could always develop it in the future or sell it. You know, So it, it yep. definitely has a, a future play into it as well. You know, the other side of this is, is that just from Wally's standpoint, it is a little unfortunate knowing that you have this great legacy, this family history, and decades ago, your grandfather just sold it off, which means you're SOL on ever doing anything with it. So from just like a personal perspective, it it, yeah. it is kind of a blow. But that, Brian, thank you so much for, for yeah. talking about that. I yeah, think it's a good you, one. you gave everybody a lot of great insight into the legality of this is and, and really what people need to understand when they are 
putting forth a a label and what they need to take into perspective, especially with people that have a, a history with heritage distilling and, and names and everything like that too. So thank you so much. Yeah. So hire lawyers. That's the left. That's the left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I feel like this love... is a PSA for tonight. Just hire lawyers, <laughs> uh, hire Brian specifically. Sponsor, yeah. Yeah. I mean, does anybody yeah. else, anybody else find the irony? Get a trademark, and your whole purpose of getting a trademark is so you can sue somebody when they violate. I'm like, that's, that's patent trolls right there. I mean, it's, lawyers got to eat too, man. I know y'all eat pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, somebody go register Minic Bourbon. <laughs> oh, actually, I don't. I don't think you could do that without, um, you know, Brian. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, who's got me on? You couldn't do it without Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's kind of move to our next segment here. So we've talked about how uh, Kentucky House Bill four fifteen. Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in two thousand sixteen as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53-gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember... Always drink responsibly. It's time to fling into spring at Total Wine and more, where fresh flavors are in full bloom and we're talking bubbly and brunch with Pinot on the porch. So no matter what's on your table, they have the wine and the savings to match. Bacon practically begs for Chardonnay. And which rosé are you feeling today? They surely have your shade. Brighten up your glass with a fresh bourbon cocktail. Mint julep or a Belmont jewel, anyone? And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers to choose from, you can expect the unexpected. And always at low prices with the best service in America. So what will it be today? Choose curbside pickup or in-store pickup. You can explore more in the store or online at TotalWine.com. All right, so let's kind of move to our next segment here. So we've talked about how uh, Kentucky House Bill 415 a few times on the podcast, and really that was the first domino that was going to start opening up interstate commerce, allowing shipping to consumers, increasing maximum purchase limits at distilleries, and also allowing cocktails uh, at the distilleries as well. And this was amplified a bit more by the Total Wine versus Tennessee Supreme Court case. But a few weeks ago, an update to House Bill 415 was enacted into law that gives Kentucky distilleries a bit more freedom and some more money in their pocket. So previously in Kentucky, if you wanted to go to a gift shop that any distillery in Kentucky, and you purchased a bottle, well, that bottle likely went from the bottling plant to the gift shop. But Kentucky law says that you cannot sell directly to a consumer, and you have to go through a wholesaler or a distributor. So that distributor gets a 20 to 30% margin just through a transfer on paper. So they didn't any, really do anything except collect their 25% tax and their margin on it. However, this new update now gives distilleries the ability to completely bypass wholesalers and sell direct putting more money back in their pocket. So this is a huge win for Kentucky distilleries. And perhaps this is going to be another domino to fall that we can see kind of going across the uh, the broader spectrum, because I know that we have preached the gospel time and time again about how wholesalers are kind of taking too much control of this market and needs to be a little bit more decentralized or deregulated from that. So I'll kind of turn it over to you all and, and kind of see you know, what we think about this. And, and Blake, I'd really want to get your perspective as well as, as a retailer. Um, is this good? Is this bad? Does this hurt you? Is it okay? Kind of give that side of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm all for the modernization of some of these, you know, antiquated laws and kind of my, my go-to line every time I get an email from somebody on Sealbox of, Hey, why can't you ship to me? I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. I hope these antiquated laws change soon. Uh, you know, talk to your congressman, senator, everything. So um, while this one specifically doesn't necessarily benefit me, it just, you know, it starts moving things forward. You know, I think distributors play a vital role in the alcohol business, but I don't think 
they necessarily need the you know the full-on monopoly effect that they have at times so i think it's good i think it's good for smaller distilleries in kentucky i think it's good for larger distilleries and anytime we can kind of push push the the boundaries a little bit on this it's it's a win in my opinion and you know i think um now we'll see this starting to pop up in other states you know it seems like kentucky liked being on the forefront of this and i know ohio has started pushing for something similar so you know the dominoes are moving slowly but i think we'll start to see more and more happen over the next uh, few years for sure i think what's really exciting about it too is it really incentivizes kentucky distilleries to really even enhance their visitor experience that much more right so on-site bottle sales now take on a much more important role so do they do they try and entice consumers and they can limit it. So just like distilleries do now, you're limited to buying so many. They scan your ID. Heaven Hill does that. Others do too. But do they hold back more of their quote unquote special releases, right? Or harder to find bottles so that they only sell them at the distillery to entice people to go there because they know they make more of a profit margin off of it. Um, and they're able to hold a little more back. I think it just opens up a whole new mindset and hopefully we'll see just the expansion of let's make the distillery a destination for the consumer. And it just adds even, you know, it adds more of that capability of being more like a high class vineyard and how they sell bottles and stuff like that, which is exciting. Yeah, that's a good point because what the, the goal is to drive, it's not only to get your product out, but it's to drive people to okay. the source and, you know, really make this what they've been trying to do for so long, make it a, a destination trip where you spend a week going to several of them or a long weekend. And, and that's what does it. If you can, have something special at the distillery, whether it's one of the standard limited releases or a, you know, they already do distillery only releases, you know, some of these great four roses ones in particular, you know, that that'll get you out there. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we look at this from the perspective of Kentucky because Kentucky wants to be on the forefront. They want to be like Napa. And I think this has probably been the biggest push that the KDA has, has gone through is because they do see this as, sort of the way that the lifeblood of bourbon could grow and it can get more consumers and, and really help all the visitors and everything like that. So this is just one thing. If, if, if you're going to try to compete with that, you have to have something that allows distilleries to be able to put more money back in their pocket. They can reinvest into the distillery and then they can uh, still help themselves grow. So I, I, I see this as a huge win. Um, yeah. I, I do want to kind of toss it over to you all because it's really hard to see how this uh, will work in in a few different ways. Um, you know, the direct to consumer through the the gift shop and the cocktails, like that's easy because it's just paperwork. You've got to file your own wholesale tax. I think you have to file your own um, whatever kind of sin taxes that they're all. You know, there's crazy amount of taxes that go into it. So there's there's a whole new level of paperwork. And I think we talked about it before as well as when we look at shipping. Now that we can say, okay, now we can also direct to consumer shipping from it. Are many distilleries really going to start picking that up though? Because for most of them, you have to create a whole new job role of somebody that's going to go and take orders and then start packing them and, and shipping it out. I know Blake knows this firsthand. That's not an easy thing to kind of set up and do. M O N E Y. M O N E Y is coming to them, Kenny, of course. Money, money, money. The interesting thing, I think they have to actually fulfill from the DSP even. Like they can't even set up like, okay, here's our e-com warehouse, call it. I think the law reads where it actually has to come from the DSP, which is kind of a problem for some of it. You know, you think about like an Angel's Envy who's downtown and is, you know, I'm sure they'll find space, but it, you know, they're not set up to fulfill. But to Fred's point, if the money's there, They'll figure it out. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. They're so excited about this. Uh, I mean, they're basically in, in a lot of ways, um, this is kind of replacing their, you know, some of their growth projections and everything for international mm -hmm. markets. I mean, the tariffs, they, I mean, right now, Kentucky bourbon distillers are basically like, you know what? We really want to support Poland. We really like to get stuff over to France, but, until these tariffs are gone, we're focusing on here. And mm -hmm. these um, this direct-to-consumer shipping has them so excited. There's one other little clause. There's a little wrinkle in there, too, uh, that no one has talked about. And that it is now legal for these distillers to ship to us, the media. 
And uh, before, mm-hmm. apparently, hmm. they were doing it illegally. So, <laughs> well, they were doing it through the, but they do it through the marketing uh, firm. So that that can happen. That's oh, that's happen. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what was happening. They were shipping it. <laughs> They were shipping it to the marketing firm <laughs> with intent to send to us. <laughs> but how is because all of my okay. samples came from a marketing company? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, going going back to your comment really quick, Fred. You know, I think you know it goes back a little more to mine too. When you think about making Kentucky and Kenny you mention it, making it more like Napa, right? You go out to California, you go to New York and their wine region, Oregon, Washington. If you're a visitor and you're flying out there you can only pack so many bottles in your suitcase, right? And if you yeah. hit up a bunch of distilleries, you're going to want to take stuff home with you. And right now that, that becomes really hard. So all of a sudden, you, you know, when I have people go down there, like, oh, what distillery should I go to? And they're like, oh, I can only, just, you know, only fit three or four bottles in my suitcase. All of a sudden they're going to distilleries. They're buying three or four bottles each distillery, having them shipped back home. This is a huge boon for, that's a Absolutely. win-win for everyone involved, right? Yeah. And then more people talk about going to visit Kentucky. And, and this has just great, great value to the state. So this is going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I'm I, I'm stoked for it, I, and I a uh, brand like one of the best uh, brands I can give you is Peerless. So Peerless is you know it's an exciting brand for a lot of people. They like it, but they have hardcore fans. Peerless has developed uh, a kind of like a, a like a mini like wild turkey kind of fandom, and like you know we got Peerless Pete in the Patreon community, and. Everybody knows him for his love for Peerless. There's a lot of Peerless Pete's out there, and uh, they're able to just get this relationship directly to them, you know, to their consumers, and just maximize that. And so I think this is going to be so huge for those kind of like small to mid tier brands that have developed uh, really big fanships like Peerless, MB Roland. Uh, Wilderness Trail doesn't need any help, but they're going to be able to get a little bit more profit off of their bottles now. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to see some more th- things also happening. Like what Blake had just started over at Sealbox is kind of having this like whiskey of the month, whiskey of the quarter sort of club that you can join. And now by being able to do that, a new release, and actually Maker's already started it, right? Maker's did that earlier this year of being able to you know, get RC6 or some of the other wood finishing series and have them being shipped to you. However, it's only limited to residents of Kentucky, which I don't know how big that's going to be until you can really scale that thing out and really grow your footprint. But being able to have a, a super fan that says, yeah, sure, I'll take any new release that you have, sign me up. And once a quarter, your credit card just gets charged and a bottle shows up your door. I yep. think that's a an easy way you look at reoccurring revenue that is a, mm-hmm. a an easy win for a lot of people too. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and kind of wrap it up with one last fun question here. And this one was actually given to us by Brian, you know, as as Man. the STEMI checks start rolling out across the country and everybody's kind of getting fourteen hundred dollars in their bank account. What's your what's your buy? What do you go to? Um, is it a bottle? Is it a a bar flight, you know, what's, what do you, what are y'all, what are y'all going for here? Uh, sealbox.com backslash. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm going. Uh, I'm getting a whole pig and calling up Blake yeah, to come over yeah. and roast it. <laughs> I think it's a good Let's opportunity. I, for, I was, was going to make the same joke and say go to our best of list for, for price ranges, but I honestly think mm-hmm. it's a good opportunity for people to stock up on their everyday sippers they love and then splurge on just that bottle or two that you've been looking at for a long time kind of, well, I don't want to say guilt freak, should always spend the money on something else, but mm-hmm. at least buy something nice you've been debating for a long time, right? So so it's a little mixture of both. And you just got to get yeah, there before say, that like, bottle's I, gone, right, Jordan? If you've well, been that, staring at that bottle. Or, or, you know, if people end up going on secondary, which I'm sure we'll see a little spike. Yeah, I, I bet you we'll see a spike on secondary. And, and I think some of the, uh, what I'm guessing, or maybe I'm hoping it, at the very least, is going to go for some of the more... Uh, truly vintage spirits um, instead of things that were released last year. But I'm with you, Jordan, you know, get, get some things that, uh, that, you know, you can get the values that are out there. The, you know, the old Forester 1920 is such an incredible value. The four roses, uh, small batch select, you know, get, get some of those and then, then treat yourself, get, get something, get something nice. Exactly. Yeah, I was like, for myself, I would probably blow it on a Dusty because big Dusty person and those things aren't getting any cheaper. So any sort of free money that goes to it, count it in. 
that's the truth. Yeah. That is true. You know what's weird? I I don't really I don't really know what I would buy here. Cause, I mean, they're, they're like there's so many things. I can tell you. I can give you a long list of things I wouldn't buy. But um, <laughs> honestly, this is this is the bottle I continue to find. I find myself buying no matter what, and I'm like hunting for it more and more. It wasn't my whiskey of the year, or I mean, it finished in you know finished well, but the George Remus Repeal Reserve. Hmm. Uh, I've been I've been oddly hunting that bottle, and it keeps getting drained. Um, and so, like, I give it to friends, and more and more, I find myself really wanting that particular expression. So that th that's what I would go for. Yeah, right on, Blake. What would you well, go good? For? Yeah, Blake, you, yeah, other than, I mean, other than spending uh, money on your own website. The, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the joke of that. Um, I mean, I'm kind of with Kenny. Like, some of the Dusty stuff isn't getting any cheaper, but there's there's still some some value out there, in my opinion, um, you, you know, with some of those bottles. So, yeah, you know, I've been eyeing a bunch of Dusty Pints right now, and so I may, may pick a few of those up. And then um, – Man, shoot, it, it's it's hard to beat what Old Forester's putting out right now. So I, I may go buy a bottle of Dant too, just for fun. But that, that'll be a <laughs> yeah. small price. Just write, write Wally over it and put it. Yeah. In. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do that, you'll have thirteen hundred and eighty dollars left. So <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that is true. <laughs> Well, good job, fellas. This is a fun roundtable. Discussed a lot of great things. Brian, thank you again for lending your expertise and Perfect. your your law knowledge because it definitely goes a long way when we would just speculate and probably get it wrong. So thank you so much oh, for being definitely, able to do that. Definitely. <laughs> Always well, happy to talk uh, about I want to go ahead. Yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll let you all kind of do your sign off. So, Brian, we already called you out, so I'll let you go first. Yep, uh, Brian with Sip and Corn and Bourbon Justice. Uh, check me out at either of those online and on the socials at Sip and Corn. And uh, Blake, really happy that you're here. I saw one of the comments about I can't drive 55 T-shirts coming out if you hadn't made it. So uh, we're we're happy that you're here. <laughs> happy to be here. Go ahead, Blake. All right, I'm I'm Blake from Bourboner and Seal Box. Um, yeah, I did miss the intro, but I made it just in time. So. Uh, yeah, you can check me out all the social media. If you go check out Instagram, you'll see why I was a few minutes late because I was cooking a whole hog and was trying to clean up after that. So as always, thanks for having me, guys. A lot of fun. I'm going to start and making a new thing where you like you all have to hand it off to somebody else. It's like so a like relay <laughs> race. Where it, it kind of worked. I mean, I was like, I was kind of like, wasn't sure what to do with it because Brian did that. And I'm like, hold on, I got to wait yeah. for Kenny to tell me it's okay to say it. Not, I don't, don't want to get yelled at. Jordan, go ahead oh, and. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is uh, Jordan, one of the three guys from Breaking Bourbon. You can find us at breakingbourbon.com on all the socials. Check us out for our near daily release calendar and, and updated reviews. And uh, Kenny, Fred, as always, thanks for having us all. Hell yeah. For sure. Guys, thank you so much. This was a, a fun episode. And make sure everybody else can follow them, follow us, Bourbon Pursuit, wherever you get your socials, and also follow Fred Minnick and buy everybody's books. Everybody here has got some books, so buy there some books go. and get knowledge and schooled on everything. But with mm. that, cheers, everybody. Thank you so much. This is Bourbon Community Roundtable number 55 in the books, and we'll be back again next month with another one. Until then, cheers. Vodka sucks. Cheers, guys. Cheers. <laughs>